thank you so much, Gwen. It's a delight to be here in Hudson. This is my first time, and I'm really impressed with what a wonderful town this is. Um, now, some of you might be interested in how I got interested in the topic of poisoning, which is often a concern to my husband when we sit down to dinner. Um, in researching my uh, other books on royal European courts, which looked into the love affairs of kings and queens, I was struck by the prevalence of suspicions of poisoning. And courts have always been snake pits of ambition, jealousy, love affairs, and revenge, so they were the perfect place where you'd want to poison an enemy. And people in their teens, 20s, and 30s died routinely. The fact was that before the advent of modern medicine with antibiotics, surgery with anesthesia, scans, many people died young as a result of natural causes. So you could get a cold and it could become pneumonia. A scratch from a rusty nail becomes tetanus. And people routinely succumb to tonsillitis, appendicitis, tuberculosis, malaria, and other common ailments that are easily treated today. But the doctors of the time were rarely sure exactly what killed an individual. And there was only one sure way to determine if poison had been the cause of death. And that was to scrape out the dead person's stomach contents, feed it to a small dog, and see if it died howling in agony. That was, that was the only way. I hope you all have strong stomachs tonight. <laughs> uh, so autopsies were performed at royal courts, but physicians, for all their love of poking around at, at dead bodies, really didn't have a clue as to what they were looking at. So they didn't help, um, which is why most of the time when a person in the royal family or of any power died, even if they had been really sick for a long time, people said, oh, it had to be poison. And the utter medical bafflement fanned the flames of fear. As a result of this ever-present fear, royal courts developed elaborate protocols to prevent poisoning, protocols which seem really stupid to us today. Unicorn horns, for instance, were valued for being able to detect poison by sweating and trembling in its presence. They were outrageously expensive, 11 times their weight in gold. And before the royal family sat down to eat, a servant would solemnly wave the unicorn horn over the king's table. Sometimes they would even poke it into the, the wine or the, the meat pie to foil the poison. Some of you might wonder how they even got unicorn horns, which are, which as we know are extremely rare. Um, these so-called unicorn horns were actually the tusks of an Arctic whale called a narwhal. Um, it, it's just a funny looking thing. It only has one and it's seven, eight, ten feet long and it's, it's kind of curled. Um, and the narwhal was not discovered as a thing until the 18th century, so until then, Europeans marveled at the fact that all the unicorns in the world seemed to go to northern Arctic beaches to die. <laughs> Other protocols, which seem very strange to us, um, I was surprised to learn in my research that servants licked and kissed the king's sheets, plates, silverware, and cups to check for poison, to make sure they weren't coated with anything, thereby depositing their germs over everything. But since they didn't know about germs, they, they didn't uh, worry about it. And, now this is the kicker, the servants tested the king's chamber pot before he sat on it. And, and you can imagine that. And then um, the, they even tested the king or the queen's royal underwear to make sure that that wasn't coated with a poison. So I guess they would try on the underwear. If it didn't burn their butt, they would then hand it to the king or queen and say, it's okay, you know, you can, you can wear it now. So um, the great irony was for all of these um, protocols, courtiers so terrified of poison were actually 
poisoning themselves every day in three different ways. Their medications, their <laughs> cosmetics, and their environments. So um, let's take a look at those before we go to examining individual cases of rumored poisoning. This is one of the many popular recipe books available starting in the 16th century to cook up home remedies and beauty treatments. This one printed in England in 1595 was written by a maester Alexis of Piedmont and was 350 pages long. And I've read the whole thing and just couldn't believe what I was seeing. These books and the top physicians at the time prescribed mercury for a variety of treatments, including constipation. And since mercury is poisonous, it was quite effective for that particular ailment. They also used arsenic skin cream on rashes. Um, because the arsenic is poison, it kills bacteria. They didn't know about bacteria, but they knew that if you had a really disgusting rash, a little bit of arsenic would, would take care of it. They used dead body parts from executed criminals in medicinal drafts and bacteria laid in animal dung, either hot and wet or dried and powdered, for a variety of, of ailments. It's all, all in this book. So the heavy metal poisons caused birth defects, kidney and liver problems, fatigue, irritability, uh, tremors, depression, paranoia, violent mood swings, excess salivation, black teeth, loss of the jaw, and death. We all know that doctors used to bleed their patients, incorrectly believing that uh, bleeding would remove a body's evil humors. If you were sick, they thought you had evil humors uh, in your body. So the physicians of King Charles II of England took 24 ounces of his blood in the first few hours after he had, he had an ultimately fatal fit in 1685. George Washington was accidentally murdered by his doctor who took 80, 80 ounces, that's 35% of his blood in 12 hours. Dead pigeons, roosters, and other birds cut in half were applied bleeding to the heads and feet of sick people to draw out the evil humors and sometimes left there putrefying for days. A cure for a serious illness was to put the patient into the hollowed out belly of a freshly slaughtered ox, horse, or mule as they believed that the heat from the carcass would draw out those evil humors. And when that carcass cooled, the patient was dragged into another one still hot and steaming. It's an odd treatment, but then again, if the patient survived that, he could probably survive anything. <laughs> Curiously, the, the wealthy and noble stood a greater chance of death by doctor as fatal physicians were expensive. Those too poor to summon a doctor relied on bed rest and chicken soup, and they had better odds of recovery. Now let's discuss the second cause of poisoning at courts, cosmetics. It is likely that toxic makeup sickened and killed many court ladies who were quite literally dying to be beautiful. Queen Elizabeth I, though she lived to be 69, which was considered fairly ancient for her time, wore a mask of poisonous cosmetics for over 40 years to cover up smallpox scars that she got uh, when she was 29. Her white foundation was a mixture of mercury, lead, vinegar, and a little bit of arsenic. She would have dusted on arsenic face powder over the foundation and colored her cheeks and lips with vermilion powdered cinnabar, which contained mercury. These ingredients would have resulted in hair loss, muscle paralysis, mood disorders, and declining mental acuity. Ironically, this makeup also corroded the skin, leaving pits and blotches so that the user had to dollop on more to cover the new damage, creating a never-ending cycle of uh, skin damage and, and poison. Elizabeth's red wigs were dyed with safflower petals and sulfur. Unfortunately, the sulfur was highly toxic and caused headaches, nausea, and nosebleeds. So here we can see the chalk white lead and arsenic 
face, the mercury lips, and the nosebleed wig. During the last years of her life, Elizabeth lost her appetite and she deteriorated mentally and physically. She was suffering depression, paranoia, mood swings, all symptoms of chronic heavy metal poisoning. Though at the time, courtiers thought she was just getting old and crotchety. She routinely erupted into temper tantrums with her ladies in waiting, and she sometimes threw cosmetics and brushes at them. Unfortunately, we'll probably never know if her bones show evidence of chronic heavy metal poisoning as researchers are not allowed to crack open her casket below Westminster Abbey and test her bones because the royal family is afraid of DNA testing and probably with good reason considering that their status in life is based on heredity. Diane de Poitiers was the scintillating mistress of King Henri II of France. And oddly, she was 19 years older than her royal lover. And in the age before Botox, she took extraordinary measures to ensure a youthful appearance. She exercised like a fiend, ate sparingly, wore a black velvet mask over her entire face whenever she stepped outside, bathed in ass's milk to keep her skin soft, and drank a potion of liquid gold. Physicians of the time believed that gold had magical qualities. And since gold never tarnishes or ages, if you ingested it, you wouldn't tarnish or age either. <laughs> Unfortunately, large amounts of gold is quite poisonous. It kills red blood cells, which must have given Diana a fashionably white complexion. Uh, it causes brittle bones, and we know she broke her leg twice. It causes thin hair, and researchers have a lock of her hair, which is extremely thin, and it inflames um, the kidneys and intestines. Instead of taking her liquid gold potion once a month, as Maester Alexis advises in, in the book we just saw, poor Diane, desperately clinging to the last shreds of youth, drank it every day. She died in 1566 at the age of 66, and when French researchers discovered her body in 2008, they were horrified to find large amounts of gold saturating the ground below her. In short, they determined that she had killed herself by gold poisoning. It did. It takes a while. It's not like arsenic. I mean, some of these chronic things, they take decades. So the third kind of poison at royal courts was environmental. The palaces themselves, gloriously beautiful though they were, were pits of filth and infection and dominions of dung. Inside the lacquered cabinets and gilded room, in gilded rooms were chamber pots brimming with human waste. So shockingly, and this, this really surprised me, I'm, I'm the person who, since I was a kid, always dreamed of being a princess in a palace with the beautiful dress, and not after I'd written this book, no. Um, some courtiers didn't even bother to find themselves a chamber pot when nature called. They just dropped their bridges and did their business wherever, in a public space. When the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza, who had led a sheltered and pious existence, arrived in England to marry King Charles II in 1661, she and her ladies were horrified to find men blithely urinating in public hallways. The ladies complained, and I quote, that they cannot stir abroad without seeing in every corner great beastly English pricks battering against every wall. <laughs> a 1675 report on the Louvre in Paris claimed that on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere, one sees there a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day. So many of you history lovers are probably aware that royal courts moved from palace to palace uh, fairly often. Do we have any Tudor history fans in this room, the six wives of Henry VIII and that kind of thing? So um, Henry VIII would go from Hampton Court to Windsor 
uh, Castle to Greenwich Palace, and the Tudor court generally made about 30 moves a year. The reason the courts traveled around so much was not for a change of scenery. It was to allow the servants to scrub all of the filth off of the floors. This caused a problem in 1682 when Louis XIV of France decided to stop running around to different palaces with his court and just say, stay at Versailles, um, where there wasn't even a river nearby where you could throw the stuff into. So inhabited by thousands of people at a time, the palace could never have a full scrubbing and, and airing. Versailles was therefore not only the most beautiful palace in Europe, but also the filthiest. Those dazzling Baroque theaters where Moliere and Dryden debuted their witty plays you know, were, were also bursting with the stuff. Each of the sumptuous <laughs> private boxes that you can see here um, had a chamber pot. Um, I imagine people used it behind a screen. I don't really know, though. There's, there's really no information that I could get. Um, one evening in a Paris theater, according to Roger de Rabutin, Comte de Boussy, in a letter, two noble women, their name shall go down in eternal infamy as Madame de Sceaux and Madame de Tremouille. Each did something foul in their pot, and then he wrote, to remove the evil smell through everything onto the dismayed audience below, <laughs> who shrieked their protest and chased the women out of the theater. Even by the lax standards of the 17th century, that was really going a bit far. So we've determined that you know, human waste was pretty much everywhere in a palace, and we must not forget animal dung. Um, horses, cows, pigs, goats, cats, chickens, and rats were, were everywhere. Um, the huge amounts of human and animal waste, in addition to being unhealthful, it caused problems for the water supply because it, it would leach into the ground, into the wells, and into um, the river. So Mozart's mother, Anna Maria, died in 1778 from drinking water from the, from the Seine River. It was that dangerous. A sip of water could, could kill you. People knew that adding wine um, to water prevented dysentery and dehydration, but they didn't know why. They weren't drunks back then. When you read about they get up for breakfast and have wine and they're drinking wine all day, it was mixed with water because um, they knew that the water would kill them. You put a little wine in it and, and you'd be fine. They didn't know about the bacteria, but they knew that it worked. But even drinking um, watered uh, wine was dangerous because the wine was often kept in lead containers and the lead would leach into the wine, and over time you'd develop a case of chronic lead poisoning. So the presence of animals, um, had, they had their own epidemics, and often, as in the case of an anthrax, these epidemics can jump to the human population. In terms of food, bear in mind, there were no food inspectors, no refrigeration, no thermometers. You know, you stick it, I, I do this every day. You know, is it cooked, is it not cooked? Back then, you, you really didn't know. Um, there were mice and rats trying to nab crumbs of food, cats to chase away the mice, dogs to turn the meat spit, and as a result, kitchens had you know, fur, waste, fleas everywhere. And, and cooking meat in a hearth, I know this because I've tried it. I actually took a, an 18th century cooking lesson at a, at a plantation in Virginia, it often results in some part of the meat being burnt and the rest sort of rare, raw, so that too could sicken you. Those gorgeous palace walls themselves could make you sick. Walls painted red, uh, which was quite a fashionable color in the 17th and 18th centuries, were made from mercury or arsenic sulfide. White paint was made from lead, yellow from arsenic sulfide. And starting in the 18th century, German chemists came up with a formula to make this very beautiful, bright emerald green that was pure arsenic. And so just from the wallpaper and, and the drapes, um, it sickened and, and killed countless. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking thousands. And let us not forget the courtiers themselves resplendent in gorgeous attire and sparkling with gemstones. Most of them must have smelled horrible, as doctors told them that washing could kill them. According to a popular uh, medical advice book from the 16th century, 
Use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body, and maketh the venomous air for to enter and for to infect the blood. Some people were so concerned about um, the health risks of bathing that they consulted an astrologer to see the best day. Should it be six months from now or eight months when I take my, my next uh, bath? It seems that King James I, pictured here in ermine and silk looking gorgeous, never washed any part of his body, even his hands, in his life. And he uh, suffered from a very bad lice infestation. Co court ladies didn't want to go into a room where he had been because the, the lice would jump on them. So now that we know of the many unintentional poisons present at royal courts, let's look at some individual cases of people who were rumored to have died of assassination by poison. In July 1329, 38-year-old Cangrande della Scala, an Italian warlord, made his state entry into the northern Italian city of Treviso, which he had just conquered. He was getting a whole swath of territory in northern Italy. He wasn't feeling very well um, during the procession, and he was glad to slide off his horse uh, and take to his bed. He had a fever, vomiting, and diarrhea, which he blamed on drinking from a polluted spring which must have meant it had been befouled with waste from the, the army, which was quite common for an army uh, on the march. Four days later, he was dead, and rumors of arsenic poisoning abounded. His nephew and heir had his doctor hanged, though we don't know why. Was it because the doctor had killed Congrande, or was it because he had not been able to save him? So for centuries, historians thought that it was either dysentery or with the fever, perhaps malaria, um, that had killed this strapping warrior in the prime of his life. Then, in 2004, a team of Italian researchers from the University of Pisa cracked open Congrande's ornate tomb uh, in the church of Santa Maria Antica in Verona to confirm or refute the rumor of arsenic poisoning. They were shocked to see the condition of the body. Um, which was no sad heap of bones, but a natural mummy with intact flesh and remarkably preserved organs, which is a great boon for determining whether he had died of natural illness or poison. So uh, researchers found his whole digestive tract full of something. Um, they first discovered that there was larger, um, there were lower than average arsenic levels so that completely refuted the rumor of arsenic poisoning, but they found in his digestive tract, mixed in with what must have been a tea of chamomile and black mulberry, which was used for combating fevers and calming the person, extraordinarily high levels of digitalis, the foxglove plant, which everyone knew was highly toxic. The digitalis was clearly what killed Congrande. But it doesn't explain his fever. Digitalis does not cause a fever. It seems he had a natural illness from the polluted water, from which he may very well have recovered, probably had many times before. And his doctor had been bribed by someone upset over Congrande's invasions to put poison in his medication. Because there were two things that a king or queen or important personage never had a tester taste. One was Holy Communion, you would just take it from the priest, and the other one was medicine from your doctor. Out of the 20 people I researched, really looking into every aspect of, of their deaths, the four that I'm sure were intentionally poisoned were all poisoned by their doctors. On a cold winter's day in 1450, 28-year-old Agnes Sorel, the most beautiful woman in France, lay dying in an abbey 80 miles from Paris. She had traveled there to see her royal lover, King Charles VII, to warn him of a plot against him. Shortly afterward, she went into premature labor and gave birth to her fourth child with the king. While her other three pregnancies had produced full-term healthy offspring, this child died within moments of birth. Agnes herself was tortured by a flux of the belly, which was a polite term for uh, nonstop diarrhea. 
Rumors flew immediately that the lady of beauty, as Agnes was known, had been poisoned. Now, if she had died of a bloody flux, which was a hemorrhaging of the universe, that would have made sense, because a lot of women did suffer that in childbirth. Um, but you know, fatal dysentery in childbirth doesn't really make sense. Everyone knew that the king's temperamental son and heir, the future Louis XI, despised his father's mistress, blaming her for his falling out with the king and all the ills of the nation. He had even punched her in the face once back in 1444 after crying, by our Lord's passion, this woman is the cause of all our misfortunes. The prince had been in open revolt against his father for four years, and it was quite possibly a plot of his that she had come to warn the king about. Had Louis, from his exile hundreds of miles away, found a way to poison Agnes? Probably. A 2005 examination of Agnes's mortal remains has revealed some shocking facts about her. For one thing, she had intestinal roundworms, which grow up to 10 inches long and live in colonies in the digestive tract. And researchers um, have been shocked at how many royal and noble people had this. Uh, you may recall a few years ago, King Richard III was dug up in a, in a parking lot in, in England, and he, he had the same, the same ailment. Um, Agnes was being treated for this condition with the male fern. It was a plant often mixed with just a tiny bit of quicksilver to kill the parasites, quicksilver being poisonous. Sometimes it did kill some of the worms. But when researchers studied the roots of her hair, um, they found off the charts levels of mercury poisoning, about 100,000 times higher than they expected to find, which is clearly not an accident that they gave her a little too much medicine for her uh, worm issue. The, the hair roots even indicated a time for when she in ingested the poison, which was between 48 and 72 hours before her death. We don't know if she was poisoned and then you know, w went into labor. I tend to think she went into premature labor and um, the doctor gave her a medication to ease her symptoms and he had been bribed by the king's rebellious son to, uh, to poison her. Whatever the case, um, the king, as devastated as he was by her death, was not in a position to charge his son and heir with murder, so he was off the hook. Perhaps some of you remember the wonderful uh, 1988 movie Amadeus about the life and death of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, arguably the world's most talented musician ever. And the movie showed um, Antonio Salieri, Mozart's great musical rival at the Habsburg court in Vienna, as having poisoned Mozart out of jealousy for his superior musical talent. Uh, and indeed, that was the rumor going around Europe after Mozart died at the age of 35 in 1791. On November 20th of that year, Mozart took to bed with a fever. Over the next couple of days, he swelled up so grotesquely, he was unable to move. His face became puffy, um, his eyes became slits, his body emitted an unbearable stench. And on December 4th, he became delirious. His doctors took uh, two to three liters of his blood, uh, reducing his body's ability to fight the infection. And the following day, he died. His widow, Constanza, privately told her friends that her husband had died of a fever, but left with two small boys, a heap of debt, and no income, she publicly fueled the rumors of poison to increase sympathy for her. She spoke of a mysterious masked stranger who had asked him um, to write a requiem mass. And as Mozart wrote the music, the story goes, he grew seriously ill, just knowing that someone was poisoning him slowly with arsenic. Unburdened by the facts, Constanza obtained a pension from the emperor and arranged profitable concerts of her late husband's music. It is far more interesting to listen to the music of someone who was mysteriously murdered than someone who died of a natural illness. And soon Constanza became wealthy while poor Salieri lamely protested the rest of his life that he had not killed Mozart. The most ridiculous part of Mozart's poison story is that many people in Vienna uh, were dying of the same illness that killed Mozart. The epidemic was called acute military 
fever, which was the cause of death listed on his um, death record. Now, we're not sure what acute military fever was, and modern researchers have come up with no less than 118 possibilities. Given his swelling, the medical term is edema, and the stench, it's clear that his kidneys had stopped functioning. And um, one of the infectious disease experts I worked with looking at this case thought that it was caused by uh, an illness called Streptococcus equi, primarily a disease of horses and cows that can jump to the human population. There was no autopsy performed on Mozart, and his body has been lost, but it's clear he wasn't poisoned by Salieri or anyone else. In 1815, after losing the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon was exiled to a rock in the middle of the South Atlantic called St. Helena. He took with him a few brave and loyal aides and 1,500 books because he was afraid he was going to die of boredom. Throughout his life, Napoleon had enjoyed excellent health. He exercised regularly, drank alcohol in moderation, and very unusual for his time. He scrubbed himself in a hot bath every morning, even on his military campaigns, which is why he carted around a bathtub with his army. Perhaps his wisest step, however, in staying healthy was keeping far away from doctors. Whenever he met a physician, his first question was invariably, Monsieur, how many patients have you killed in your practice? He rarely, if ever, took medication or submitted to bleeding, purging, or, or puking. On September 20th, 1817, for the first time, he complained of adult pain in the area of the torso um, right near the, his right elbow. And over time, his symptoms included nausea, vomiting, sleeplessness, constipation, and depression. He lost more than 20 pounds in a few months as the pain spread over his entire abdomen. And when his Italian doctor, Francois Carlo Antomarchi, urged him to take some medication, Napoleon snorted, keep your medicines. I don't want to have two diseases, the one I have already and the one you'll give me. He was right. The illness worsened with horrifying pain. Um, he could no longer eat solid foods, but suck the juice out of pieces of meat. On April 15th, 1821, he wrote in his will, I die prematurely, assassinated by the English oligarchy and its hired killer. The English nation will not be slow in avenging me. On May 5th, he fell into a coma and died at the age of 51. So the European powers were really afraid that if rumors got out Napoleon had been poisoned, revolutions would spring up all across the continent because a lot of people were really unhappy with the old royalist power structure that took over after he left and they wanted him back. So his autopsy was one of the most important ever undertaken. It revealed a cancerous tumor covering almost his entire stomach and indeed Napoleon's father had died of the same thing, big cancerous tumor, when he was 38. The emperor's cancer, however, had grown out of an old gastric ulcer, which happens in six to nine percent of cases. If you have an untreated ulcer, it can, over time, turn into cancer. He probably had the ulcer for many years, and it was the reason he often had his hand inside his coat massaging his sore stomach. So the verdict was stomach cancer. But in the 1960s, a Swedish dentist and Napoleon buff studying Napoleon's illness recognized 22 out of 30 symptoms of chronic arsenic poisoning. He obtained several locks of Napoleon's hair, because back then, as a, as a memento, you would cut your hair and give it to people. Um, and there was actually a long list of people that whenever he got a haircut were, were there waiting for, for locks of hair from this important person. So um, this Swedish gentleman, tested them, this technology was just coming out, and it revealed arsenic content up to 100 times the normal amount throughout his hair, not just at the root, um, but all the way through. So he decided that Napoleon had, in fact, despite what's going on in his stomach, been poisoned with, with arsenic. But this is the interesting thing. After the initial research, Napoleon's hair from his pre-St. Helena days, going back to childhood, was tested, and it all revealed the same amount of arsenic content, 100 times the normal amount. How did the arsenic get into his hair? 
I think I have the answer. Napoleon, as we've said, was a stickler for hygiene. And an army on the march um, you know, often had problems with lice. I believe that since childhood he used an arsenic-based hair tonic to, to make sure there were no vermin in his hair. And given his strong constitution, healthy lifestyle, and good genes, it, it never seemed to adversely affect his health. And he probably also built a tolerance up to it, tolerance to it up um, over time. So we're just going to take a quick run through some of the people I cover. Um, this is Jean d'Albret, Queen of Navarre. In 1572, the leader of the Huguenots in France went shopping with her arch enemy, Queen Catherine de Medici, tried on a pair of gloves, immediately felt sick, and died four days later. Had the gloves been drenched in poison by the Catholic Queen, who despised John? Jean's death, coming when it did, set in motion the events leading up to the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre when Catholics killed uh, thousands of innocent, innocent Huguenots. In 1601, after dining at a banquet in Prague, the famous astronomer Tycho Brahe became ill and died in agony 11 days later. Did his assistant, the nasty, vengeful Johannes Kepler, poison him with mercury to steal his 40 years of astronomical observations and come up with his own theories? Scientists have dug up Tycho, and I worked with the doctor who did, and found what really happened to him. In 1553, the bright and athletic boy king, the son and heir of Henry VIII, died mysteriously and horribly, aged 15, swollen and bruised. His finger and toenails had turned black and fallen off. Had he been poisoned to make way for Lady Jane Grey or the Catholic Mary Tudor to take the throne, um, most people believe that he was poisoned very slowly to make it look like uh, an illness to, to affect regime change. Well, I have the answer to that. In the Renaissance, white paint was made of lead, yellow contained uh, arsenic, red paint also made from arsenic. Many artists sucked on their brushes to create a more pointed tip. And so slow poisoning must have contributed to the temperamental mood swings of many of history's most famous painters. Did Caravaggio, one of the most brilliant artists of all time, kill himself in 1610 with his own toxic paints? Well, they found what they think is Caravaggio and have an answer to that. In 1599, Gabrielle d'Estray, the beautiful mistress of King Henry IV of France, pregnant with their fourth child, was set to marry the king on Easter Sunday and become queen of France. Now, many people were really upset to have a fallen woman as, queen, uh, as the queen. And when she died, a horribly gruesome and shocking death, 36 hours before the wedding and coronation, everyone agreed that she must have been poisoned. But was she? Henrietta Stuart, Duchess d'Orléans, was the beloved younger sister of Charles II of England, and she became the sister-in-law of Louis XIV of France by marrying his younger brother, Philippe. Theirs was a tumultuous marriage, as they both had numerous affairs with men, sometimes with the same men, so it got very confusing. <laughs> In 1670, at the age of 26, she played a role in exiling um, the love of Philippe's life, the dashing Chevalier de Lorraine. And um, soon after that, she drank a cup of chicory water, clutched her side, cried out, I am poisoned, and died after nine hours of absolute agony. The autopsy witnessed by dozens of noblemen and the English ambassador indicated arsenic poisoning, though the French doctors denied it. And her death almost caused a war between uh, France and England. And more recently, scientists have discovered whether there was any truth to the rumor that her furious husband had killed her. In the 19th century, scientific advances reduced the fear of poison. In 1836, a British scientist named James Marsh, pictured here, discovered a test to prove arsenic poisoning, and tests for other poisons followed soon after. And researchers and scientists suddenly made huge strides. New procedures resulted in clear, accurate diagnoses of most illnesses and causes of death. And the ignorance fueled fear that spread rumors of poison was quieted by science. So you might think poison is a thing of the past.
Unfortunately, poison did not vanish with royals of centuries ago. In recent decades, the Soviet Union and now Russia have poisoned uh, dissidents, activists, journalists, and most recently a former spy. Indeed, instead of holding a unicorn horn over their food, Russians who rouse the ire of Vladimir Putin would be well advised to hold a Geiger counter. In 2004, 50 year old Viktor Yushchenko was running for a president of Ukraine. He was heavily pro West, leaning away from Russia and towards NATO and the US. On September 5th, in the final weeks of a bitter and sometimes violent campaign, Yushchenko ate soup with a group of uh, senior Ukrainian officials and almost immediately became ill. Poisoned with TCCD, a chemical compound also known as dioxin, um, and it's an ingredient in Agent Orange. It's 170,000 times more poisonous than cyanide. Because of the extraordinary uh, medical measures taken to save him, he did survive, but look at the change in his appearance. Uh, in August 2009, the respected British medical journal, The Lancet, um, published a paper concluding that the poison was so pure it was definitely made in uh, a laboratory. When the victim pointed the finger at Russia for poisoning him, the Russians accused him of either working with doctors to falsify his records, well, that doesn't look like falsification to me, or, or maybe he poisoned himself to win sympathy and get votes. And he, did, he won the election, but it took him a while to, to look decent again. Um, Alexander Litvinenko was a former Russian intelligence officer who fled to Great Britain, where he wrote books and articles uh, highly critical of Vladimir Putin. In 2006, Litvinenko met at a London hotel with two former KGB officers and later that day fell ill with vomiting and diarrhea. Doctors eventually determined he had been poisoned with polonium-210, a million times more poisonous than cyanide. This substance emits radioactive particles that tear cells apart, destroying the immune system and causing catastrophic organ failure. And tests showed a staggering amount of the stuff in his samples, more than 200 times what was actually needed to uh, kill him. Polonium-210 can only be manufactured in state-regulated nuclear reactors, and the dose that poisoned um, Litvinenko has subsequent subsequently been traced back to a particular Russian nuclear plant. Um, investigators collecting evidence, you know, where did he ingest this poison, they found off the charts levels of polonium in a teapot in the hotel room where he, he, he met these, uh, these agents. And when he died on November 23rd, his body was so radioactive that doctors waited a week to perform the autopsy in hazmat suits. One of the men who had lunch with him uh, ended up poisoning himself and had to receive hospital treatment for radiation poisoning in uh, Russia. There have been many more cases of Russian state-sponsored poisoning, but let's bring it up to date with this one, which just happened three months ago. On the afternoon of March 14th, 2018, in Salisbury, England, a doctor and a nurse, providently enough, were walking through a park when they noticed two people slumped on a bench. Paramedics quickly arrived and took the couple to a hospital where, where they were identified as 66-year-old Sergei Skripal, uh, an expat Russian, and his 33-year-old daughter, Yulia, who was visiting from Moscow. She had just come in the day before. Authorities soon determined that they had been poisoned with a nerve agent called Novichok, a type um, designed and manufactured only in Russia, which had been smeared on the front doorknob of their house. Sergei Skripal was a former uh, Russian military intelligence officer who had started working in the 1990s as a double agent for the UK's uh, MI6 intelligence agency, the James Bond agency. And he was arrested in Russia, sentenced to prison for 13 years, um, and in 2010 he was released as a part of an elaborate spy swap and settled in uh, Salisbury, England. So surprisingly, and this really shocked me, I was following this case day to day, um, both the, the daughter first and then the father have recovered to the point where they've been released from the hospital um, and they're in a safe house so this doesn't happen again. Uh, medical experts attributed their recovery to the readily available treatments and antidotes um, they received. Russia has denied involvement, of course, in the poisoning and accused Britain of planting the Novichok, which can only be 
obtained in Russia. On the doorknob to besmirch Russia's international reputation, the Russian government has accused the UK of holding the two Russian nationals against their will, and both nations have sent dozens of diplomats packing. It, it's tempting to assume that Yulia's poisoning on the day after she arrived, because she hadn't seen him for a year or two, um, was not the result of unfortunate timing, but was in fact quite intentional. If the assassination came at Putin's direction, and experts say they don't know how it could have come anywhere else, Yulia's travel plans would have been known. Surely they were looking at her, you know, her emails and her, her travel plans and maybe bugging her phone. And um, it's likely that the poisoning was time to get rid of her too, as a strong message to other would-be traitors. We won't just kill you, we will also kill your family. So poison, as we have seen, has been around a very long time. It offers the advantages of stealth and a long lead getaway. Um, for instance, the British have no suspects of who smeared this stuff uh, on the Skripal's um, doorknob. But it can be a tricky business, as, as we have seen, especially today with, with modern uh, medical technology. Many victims uh, survive if they receive rapid and aggressive uh, medical intervention. Whatever the case, I think it's clear, poison will always be with us. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>
poison anybody. I don't think so. You know, one way to attack your political opponents back then was to pick on the women in the family who really weren't in a position to defend themselves. So, you know, they were incestuous, they were whores, they were poisoners, and I, I don't think she deserved. I, I wrote about her in Sex with a Queen. You should probably read that. <laughs> yes? Well, you, yeah, you hear about that, like a, a ring where you know you kind of you're, you're fixing the wine and the and the arsenic goes in. I, you know, I haven't heard of like a factory. I, I think that they you would um, you would commission a, a special piece from your from your jewelry, for, from your jeweler. Now, I, I was interested to learn that there were um, there in in uh, Venice and in um, Tuscany the rulers had poison factories. So they would develop poisons and test out antidotes. Um, and they would, t they would test the poisons and antidotes on um, convicted criminals who volunteered. So if you were going to hang anyway, and, and they did give you the option, do you want to hang or do you want to try out this poison and antidote? And there's a chance you could survive. So a lot of them said, okay, you know, um, and then they died so horribly that they wished that they had actually just gone and been hanged. Um, but so there, was, there were state-sponsored uh, poison factories. Yes? If you go back to Roman times, supposedly they put a premium on health and cleanliness yes. and Romans were very clean. They had hundreds of huge public baths and fountains and swimming pools. And <clears throat> not because of health issues, they just thought that the dirt was gross. And um, when a doctor was going to uh, perform an operation, he, you know, he scrubbed and boiled his, his instruments just so that it looked clean. And so I imagine they saved a lot of, of lives. There's a section in my book about childbed fever. I mean, Henry VIII had six wives. Two of them died of this. One was Jane Seymour with his son, and then the sixth one, Catherine Parr, died of it when she married another guy after Henry died. So that's, you know, two out of six died of this. And it's caused by doctors having dirty hands and instruments while they're delivering. Uh, a baby. So I imagine that occurred much less in ancient Rome. Yeah. Yes? So, it was briefly mentioned in your introduction, the madness of King George. So what's the current thinking of poison? Yes, I have a, a section um, on that. He was poisoned um, by his doctors who were trying to heal him. It, it seems that he had um, the, the porphyria gene. And people who have this particular um, uh, gene, most of them never have any symptoms of it. Um, and he was 50 before he went crazy. So he started having some stomach problems and um, the doctors gave him antimony, which is a form of arsenic, it's an arsenic cousin. And an antimony and arsenic drive porphyria into, into hyperdrive. And the sicker he got, the more antimony they gave him. If they had just let him go through this bout of, of stomach issues, and, and he had, the reason he probably fell into this at the age of 50 is because he put arsenic lice powder on his wigs, and over time, the arsenic, just you know, little tiny bits, got in his bloodstream, kicked the porphyria in, and then his doctors loaded him with more arsenic. And so he finally lost his mind, became blind, deaf. I mean, he thought he was dead the last years of his life, but he was pretty happy about being dead. And I mean, he, he, was, he was totally great. But so that was, you know, in, the whole thing was induced by his doctors. Is that it? Surely you have some more questions. Yes. Oh, gosh, who figured that out? Probably in the late 19th, early 20th century, they, they figured that out. Yeah, once they had all those tests. Yes? Oh, well, having done sex with kings and sex with queens, I think it's on to sex with presidents. 
lot of material. <laughs> That's true. I was, I was just doing, I was looking at um, Warren Harding. <laughs> yes. Someone here? Have, yes. You know, I, I have um, some statements about the Italians. Italians <clears throat> had a reputation for being poisoners. Now, they did have the poison factories in Venice and in Tuscany, but the King of Spain had one, and there probably were other ones at different royal courts that we, we don't know about. So, you know, an Italian comes to France, and she brought her own um, perfumer who's always cooking up stuff in the basement. And so, of course, there's a reputation that, you know, he's her poisoner. And people at the French court were dropping like flies. Now we know why, right? It's, it's the human waste, it's the, it, it's the mercury, it's the doctors. And so whenever anyone would die at the French court, they're like, ah, that Italian woman. You know, um, the, um, the heir to the throne in 1536 died rather suddenly. And um, the Italian, he had an Italian secretary. They pulled him apart um, with four horses. And then in subsequent centuries, doctors looking at the, the prince's symptoms said it was a natural death. He had tuberculosis. You know, and sometimes you can have tuberculosis for years, and then suddenly you get a bad infection, you're gone in a couple of days. So, yes? Uh, in the United States? Wow. Um, you know, other than, you know, I can't really think of anything. I mean, there are always, of course, people who murder their wives and husbands, I mean, you know. But, you know, in the top, like in the White House, I've never, um, I, I have heard there was some suspicion that Warren, Warren Harding was poisoned by his wife Florence when she found out he had an illegitimate baby with a, a girl, but I don't, I don't believe that. I think there again, he, you know, he had a natural death. I mean, most people do. <laughs> yes. In the morning dresses, I haven't heard of that. It's certainly possible. I, you know, in Victorian England, everything was green. The, the the wallpaper, the lampshades, the kids' toys were painted green, and um, it took them decades to figure out this was killing people. And often, if you had a house with you know the red room, the green room, the blue room, the people who spent who slept in the green room would get sick and die. So it took them a while to figure it out, and then there was this massive undertaking, we've got to get the green wallpaper off the walls, and they had to open the windows, and the wallpaper removers would often faint, so the owner of the home had to be there with brandy, you know, to slap them back, you know, and, and get them to, to pull the stuff down again. You know, and then the other question is, you know, we can laugh at them, and we, we do, and it is funny, um, we're probably doing the same thing to ourselves in some way that, that we don't know, right? There's, there's um, you know, a rise in, in dementia, in autism, in cancer. What is it? Is it um, uh, the pesticides? Is it cell phones? Is it dry cleaning? I, I don't know. A hundred years from now, they'll read about us and say, oh, those silly idiots, they didn't know it was the mm, right? So, yes. Yes. And so I, I wonder, you know, that was the Victorian age, so to speak. I don't think lead beads itself, unless you were sweating a lot, and I don't think those people ever sweated, right? Like it wasn't polite. <laughs> you know, and the, the body can put up with a certain amount of poison and kind of, you know, work it out over time. It depends on a lot of things, your genetics and, and, and a lot of, of other things. But, you know, it's really the arsenic that, uh, that was a lot more dangerous. Yes? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, this is about 1570s or 80s. And my best friend is a costume designer for um, the Maryland and Colorado Renaissance festivals. So she makes and sells these things, and since I'm her best friend, I get a, I get a discount. Um, <laughs> and I get to deduct it for my taxes because, because it's a performance costume, so aren't I lucky? 
Anything else? Yes? In the old movies, they showed that uh, the guy would take a pill and he'd be dead instantly, like a spy. What yeah. did he say? You can do, what was the guy, was it Himmler? I don't know, some guy in World War II did that. I think it was cyanide. But hundreds of years ago, arsenic doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't kill you instantaneously. So if I had arsenic in my wine or my stew, that's where they would generally hide it, 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 might, it would probably be an hour or two before I even got a stomach ache because it do, you don't feel it until it hits your stomach and it starts getting absorbed into your bloodstream. And then you start you know, having the vomiting and diarrhea. So w when, when the taste tester, this is what I thought was so funny. You see in the movies, you know, the king is sitting and the tester nibbles and he nods, yes, monsieur, you may eat. Um, you know, that would have told you nothing. And the king is not going to wait two hours you know, while his meal turns cold to eat. So I think those testers, you know, maybe they were looking for an odd flavor or texture, but in terms of the amount of time, that would have been useless. I mean, the unicorn horn would have, you know, done more good than the <laughs> well, if he took it, it would take longer for him to die. Not like in the movies. Well, it depends on what, what is the year of the, like that guy in um, the Nuremberg trials, was it Himmler? I forget, there was a German guy. Goering, right. Goering had a cyanide pellet in, in like the, the, the lining of his briefcase, and he got this young American guy, yo, can I have my briefcase before I go to be hanged, which he thought was ignominious. And so he took the pellet, bit on it, and died. But that, that's a modern poison, cyanide. We're talking like 500 years ago. They, they wouldn't have had something like that. Yeah. Yes? You know, I, I, ha I haven't come across that. If you poured arsenic in somebody's ear, I, I really wonder what it would do because it's not going into your digestive tract and your bloodstream. Um, by the same token, they were so worried about poison clothes and chamber pot, you know, all of this stupid stuff. It, if you had something caustic on an article of clothing or your sheets or whatever, um, you, would, you would feel discomfort. You'd say, oh, these underpants are sort of like burning me, right? And you would take them off and you would, you would wash your skin. So uh, there was only one case, it was an awful story in the 1870s. Arsenic used to look like flour and you could buy it for a few pennies, a pound of it, and I guess it's rat poison, I don't know. So this lady somehow got arsenic mixed up with baby powder. And so she, she powdered her whole eight month baby girl and the little girl could not say, ouch, right, my skin hurts, and um, she blistered, and then it got into her bloodstream and killed her. But, but anyone with the power of, of language is, n is not going to let that happen. So, yes? Oh, it's a mineral. It's a heavy metal poison. It's like rocks in the ground that you find in certain mines. So, it was primarily Well, it was Without used in it, it, okay. So it was nature. used in paints. It was used in cosmetics. Um, it was used to poison rats. You know, it had a variety uh, of uses. And then they also found that you know it could kill people quite easily. But like, why was it in cosmetics or paints or? Um, they found that it gave you like if you put it in your cosmetics, it gave you kind of a silvery look. And they thought that they, they knew it was poisonous, but they thought if they just put a little bit in, you know, with a little mercury and lead, um, <laughs> it wouldn't hurt you. And, and the fact is, you know, it's not like you would put, put the makeup on and then die. It would take years. In the, in the case of Queen Elizabeth, 40 years. I mean, there was a case of a, of a beauty in uh, London in the 1750s who within two years of using this stuff, I mean, her teeth fell out, it was horrible, you know, and she wouldn't stop 
putting it on because she was so vain. So it just depends a lot on your, your genetics, how you're going to react to this stuff. Yeah. Yes? So arsenic and these other things were not known as poisonous back then. What did they do? I'm not trying to find out. You know, I'm just curious. Well, no, they, they were known as poison. They just thought if you used just a tiny bit. Well, when somebody bit, wanted to poison somebody, yeah. what were common poisons? Arsenic. But a, but a large amount, you know, and maybe they would mix it with some mercury sulfide, and that's why they had these laboratories to try to figure out what, what would really be effective, and then they wanted it to be odorless and tasteless, so if you put it in somebody's um, wine, they wouldn't think this wine really tastes horrible, I'm not going to drink it, right? So, so that's why they had to develop the, the right recipe. Yeah? Where did hemlock fit into all of this? Hemlock was popular in the ancient world. Um, you know, my editor cut out, I had a section on ancient Greece and Rome. Ancient Rome actually had a poisoning, there was a poisoner named Locusta, and Nero was so fond of her that he set her up in her own poisoning school. So you could go and get your degree in, you know, poisoning. Um, but they were, in that age, they were plant-based, so it was digitalis and it was hemlock, which killed uh, Socrates. You know, uh, and then it was only in the medieval period when they started realizing that the, the heavy metal poison poisons were a lot more effective. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you so much. You've been a delightful. <laughs>